Well, good morning, South Metro Vineyard Church. Uh, my name is Nick Fox. I'm one of the council members here at South Metro. And uh, welcome to Digital Church, Virtual Church, from the privacy of our own homes and our own video screens. This is now the third week in a row that we've done virtual church this way. A couple weeks ago when the COVID-19 outbreak pandemic hit, um, Pastor Greg shared a message about uh, not panicking and trusting God and, and times of trouble like this. And then we did an interview with Vino Raj, one of our other council members who's a medical doctor. That same week, uh, Vino and a couple other people interviewed Dr. Frank Rame, who's an infectious disease specialist. And guys, I gotta tell you, I've been so thankful for our community in times like this, where we have access to really good information, people who are literally experts uh, on the kinds of diseases that we're experiencing here. That's been super fun to me to watch uh, from a distance as I've been traveling uh, and uh, and just to stay informed, that sort of thing. Last week, Amy Berletic uh, shared a message uh, just about faith and as we're in this Lenten season, what it means to really actively put your faith uh, into Jesus, uh, to sit in that chair, to activate, to move, to do uh, active things, and uh, that was a lot of fun to watch as well. As I mentioned, this is week three, and I'm actually coming to you from quarantine here in my home office. I am not at the church, as the other videos have been filmed. I am uh, sitting in my home office here. Uh, my wife and I were traveling the last two weeks in Israel, the Holy Land, and um, while we were gone, um, actually while we, when we left, um, the coronavirus was just like this new thing that uh, we didn't really know what it meant. We knew it was a bad sickness that we were trying to avoid, all that kind of stuff. But while we were over there, um, it kind of blew up. And, uh, you know, we were reading online about, you know, people buying up all the toilet paper and, all, you know, all that kind of stuff, all, everything that was going on. And uh, we felt a little bit sheltered while we were in Israel and um, it, it kind of hadn't hit there uh, quite as hard. And then about halfway through our trip, they started to really uh, bring in some sanctions. We still got to do 90 or 95 percent of everything we wanted to do, but um, the trip got cut about a day short. Um, no big deal. We didn't get stuck anywhere. We didn't get stuck in Europe or in the Holy Land or anything like that. It's kind of a long travel day on the way home, but it's kind of to be expected. But guys, I got to tell you, I've been wanting to go to Israel for decades I love to travel. Um, I love the New Testament. I love the Old Testament. I love the Bible. I love learning. And to see the sights with my own eyes has been um, just amazing. It's something that I just really wanted to do uh, for so long. And so last summer, my wife and I, uh, you know, found a trip and uh, joined up with a, a, a study trip, actually, where you go to the sites and then you read scriptures and you experience some teaching. Um, and it was, you know, not to overhype it or anything, but it really was a life-changing experience. There's a saying that the Holy Land is the fifth gospel. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but and those are our four gospels. We don't need another one. Um, those do the trick, so to speak. But it's the Holy Land's been called the fifth gospel because when you're there, you see the sites, you visit the towns that Jesus did miracles in. We went to a synagogue and Magdala and Capernaum. Uh, we know that Jesus was literally in the uh, synagogue at Capernaum and cast out a demon and did miracles. And, you know, stuff like that. The things you read about for so long and then to physically be there, guys, was absolutely life-changing. So what we want to do today, um, since we're doing virtual church anyway... Um, I want to take you on a little bit of a tour. I filmed some videos while we were in the Holy Land at some specific sites, and I did a little teaching there, and uh, my wife filmed me uh, using the phone camera uh, and all that kind of stuff. So we've, we've put a few of those together. I just want to take you on a virtual tour uh, of the Holy Land. As we prepare for Lent, the time leading up to the last week in Jesus' life where he'll go to Jerusalem and he'll be handed over to the the hands of men, and he'll be um, accused in a trial with false witnesses and that sort of thing. And then he'll be handed over to the Romans and ultimately crucified and killed and then raises from the dead. Um, as we lead up to that point, I want to take you to some of those sites, uh, virtually, digitally. I'd love for you to be able to come with me and let's do it in person. Maybe that we'll be able to do that someday. I would love to have the opportunity to lead trips there myself. Um, but for now, we'll have to do it the digital way. So since we're quarantined and, um, you know, limited to video anyway, um, that's what we'd like to do today. So um, I'm going to pray for us and then um, just make a few comments to introduce the video and then we'll get going. So God, we thank you for being here uh, with us wherever we are, Lord. We know that um, the psalmist writes in Psalm 139, where can we go from your presence? Where can we flee from your spirit? No matter where we go, you're there. And so, Lord, we know that 
when we're meeting in our own homes uh, this morning that you're uh, you're with us. You're here with us and you're you're close to us. You're not just with us, you're close to us. And your tangible presence is here. So help us to feel that uh, even through the the magic of video or whatever else we might say. Lord, I pray that you would touch lives today and do cool stuff. Uh, bring us together as a community, uh, even through the videos that we're, uh, that we're participating in today. In Jesus' name, amen. So guys, as we get ready to start the video, just a couple thoughts here. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize for the quality of these videos. Um, we're, we're on a mountaintop using a phone. You, you know how that is. My wife was the camera person for most of these, and she did an excellent job, very steady hand, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, there's kids screaming in the background, and there's wind and weather and, you know, stuff like that. So um, give me a little grace there. We're doing our best, um, but it's not exactly professional quality. Maybe we'll have an opportunity to record more professional examples of these in the future sometime, but that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, also, forgive me for coming from my uh, home office here in my basement in quarantine. When you travel outside of the country, one of the things that you have to do in the days we're living in right now with the coronavirus is quarantine yourself a little bit. So that's why we're not filming uh, at the church under a little bit better circumstances. I want to be aware of that. And I do, I, you know, I kind of get into professor mode sometimes on these sites and I, I cover a lot of information um, and I'm quoting scriptures and stuff like that. We're going to try to put those on the screen for you as much as we can. Um, but if I go too fast, I apologize. Um, I, I think it'll still be meaningful meaningful for us. So um, here we go. We're going to start in the Galilee uh, where Jesus did most of his ministry. So here we go. Hey, everybody. Uh, we are up here on Mount Arbel, and we're overlooking Galilee, a place where Jesus did a large percentage of his ministry. And um, this over here to the right, this is the Sea of Galilee that we're looking at. And to put it in perspective, uh, the Sea of Galilee is 200 meters below sea level. And we're up on Mount Arbel, which is 180 meters above sea level. So that's almost 400 meters below us down there. You can see how far you can see from this angle. You see uh, Magdal, and if you go up the coast, Capernaum is up there around the corner, and then we'd ultimately get to Bethsaida on the Jordan, that sort of thing. Um, but it's a pretty cool, pretty cool view up here. This is also a possible site. We don't know for sure, but it was a mountain very much like this uh, that Jesus gave the Great Commission to his disciples and uh, potentially is the Mount of Ascension where Jesus would have uh, given the charge to the disciples and went back up to heaven. So a uh, pretty cool view here. Wanted to show this to you. Um, we'll have the camera person, my wife Angela, swing around here and give you a good look at what we're looking at here. But um, it's a pretty amazing view that you can see off in the distance. So... Uh, we're having a great time here. We're we're healthy. We're having fun. Uh, things are going good. Um, so drink in that view a little bit. And uh, give you one last look at the Galilee over here, where Jesus did so much of his ministry. So hope you guys are doing well. We're safe. We're healthy. We'll see you. All right, guys, how you doing? Uh, I wanted to show you up here. This is uh, the cliff of Nazareth in uh, Luke chapter 4. Um, Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. All right, guys, well, time for me to cut in. I mentioned that the uh, quality was not great. We actually had pretty good weather when we were in the Holy Land. But there was one day, this day, that you can see right here when we were in Nazareth, when things got really windy and really w rainy. You can see the the wind coming sideways in the video, raining on me as we're filming this video. So let me tell you what's going on. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus shares his first sermon, uh, and it's in his hometown in Nazareth. Uh, the first sermon we have recorded. We know that he he had done some miracles and some preaching and teaching in Capernaum which I was at the day before uh, we shot that video. But when he goes to Nazareth, um, he goes into the synagogue and he preaches. He preaches from Isaiah chapter 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, uh, to proclaim freedom to the captives, to bind up the brokenhearted, that sort of thing. And um, when he's done, he says, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And then he's going to tell a couple stories. He's going to tell some stories about Gentiles, not Jews, but Gentiles getting healed. And uh, just he kind of is selective from what stories he chooses from the Old Testament. And the Jews don't like to hear this. They don't like uh, this idea that outsiders, Gentiles, people that they don't even kind of 
considering their bandwidth getting this grace uh, from Jesus as he shows up. They, they've they heard his stories of healing in other places. And this is their hometown boy uh, doing healing in other places. But he comes to their town and he talks about Gentiles getting healing. And so it says they become so angry at him that they drag him up to the high point of the city uh, with the intent of throwing him off and, and stoning him and killing him. And that's where I'm, I'm standing in this video. And you get a really cool uh, view just of, of Nazareth, the town. Just some fun facts. Nazareth in the first century was about 200 people, and now it's about 200,000 people. So it's really blossomed and become an important town um, in Israel. Um, as I'm up there, I show you uh, Mount Tabor off in the distance, which is the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus goes up with a couple of his disciples and he's transfigured before them and the voice comes from heaven and um, he's talking with Moses and Elijah up on the mountain. So just, again, it's so cool to be present uh, in those situations. But likely that mountain that I'm standing on in the video there uh, is that high point in the city where the Jews in the in the synagogue dragged Jesus up to the edge and tried to throw him off and it says he walked through the crowd uh, he got away essentially at that point he wouldn't meet his end then but um, once again I apologize for the sound in that video that's just kind of uh, what we're dealing with when it comes to rain and weather and that sort of thing but guys isn't it cool just to be able to go uh, to those sites and uh, you know you, you read about it in Luke chapter 4 and then you, I, I get to go stand there and show you some things I just think that's pretty cool so Sorry about the weather. So we're here on the Mount of Olives and uh, in Luke chapter nine, uh, at the end of Luke chapter nine, we see Jesus say something after he's done his ministry in Galilee around the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum and uh, Bethsaida and Nazareth, places like that. Um, the text says at the end of the chapter that he uh, set out for Jerusalem. He resolutely set out for Jerusalem or literally he set his face Towards Jerusalem, And for the next 10, 11 chapters, we see this on the way section of the Gospel of Luke where Jesus is traveling and the author doesn't let us forget that he's on his way several times. He's going to see Jerusalem off in the distance and he's going to weep over it. And uh, in Luke chapter 19, um, he's going to come close to the city and for the last time he's going to look at the city and he's going to weep over it. And uh, he's going to send the disciples in um, from, he's in Jericho, and he's going to send, the, send them into Bethany and Bethphage to get a donkey, a colt for him. And uh, that's where the triumphal entry is going to happen. It's going to go uh, through Bethany and Bethphage and through the Mount of Olives where we're standing right now and down into this valley and then into the city proper of Jerusalem. And that's what we're looking at right now. Uh, you see the Temple Mount over there, where the Dome of the Rock is standing, is where the temple would have been in the second temple period in the first century. And uh, Jesus would have, would have entered the city right here, and it says he does several things. He enters and he goes into the temple, and one of the first things he does after the triumphal entry, entering the temple, is he's going to cleanse the temple. He's going to tip over tables. He's going to dump out the coins. It's a prophetic act talking about uh, God cleansing the temple and getting it ready. The message of Luke is that uh, God is not limited to a house built by human hands, Luke Acts, uh, but instead the Holy Spirit wants to dwell with his people, and so he's going to cleanse the temple, and then he's going to set up shop, and he's going to start teaching. And uh, this begins the last week of his life. It's towards the end of that week that he's going to be arrested. We're just um, a few minutes' walk from the Garden of Gethsemane. We were there earlier, and uh, that's where he's going to pray and struggle and wrestle with his father about what his fate is going to be before he gets betrayed by Judas and arrested and set on trial and actually Caiaphas's house and Pilate's uh, mansion the Antonia fortress all those important locations where Jesus is going to spend the last couple the last week and then the last couple days of his life um, are right behind us here so uh, it's a pretty powerful picture that we're looking at and uh, just look at look at the old city there behind me as we pan across it's uh it's pretty breath breathtaking on this clear morning. So, a couple other things to point out here. You see the the stairs right down here, where the up against the wall. Those are uh, some original stairs from the date back to the first century. Um, Jesus literally walked up those stairs at, at some point. Um, if you go down a little ways and turn right, that's where you get to the western wall. Uh, we're on the east side right now, looking looking to the west, but on the east side of the Temple Mount, the western wall is on the other side, and we're about to go there here in a little bit. God bless.
Well, friends, we're here at the Western Wall. Um, this is the western side of the Temple Mount, and um, the stones closest to the bottom there uh, are left over from Herod's Temple and uh, the time when Jesus was here, and Jesus predicted that no stone would be left on another. And that is hyperbole, because we do have a few stones left, but he was pretty close uh, to that being literally too, true of what he predicted through hyperbole when Rome came in and destroyed it. And so um, this is a special place here where we come and uh, show our respects, and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And um, our Jewish brothers and sisters are there doing just that. And so I just wanted to show you uh, what it's like here at the Western Wall uh, in Jerusalem up against the Temple Mount. So take a look. So guys, we are on the Temple Mount here. Uh, behind me is the, uh, the Dome on the Rock, the Muslim, uh, the Muslim mosque uh, up here. A Muslim shrine, rather. It's not a mosque, it's actually a shrine. Um, is right behind us. But we are standing on the Temple Mount, um, presumably where Jesus would have taught the last week of his life, where he would have set up shop and uh, taught the people, would have went into the temple numerous times. And so when you think about the Jewish temple, you think about concentric circles of holiness. So the Psalms talk about the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. All of the earth is God's possession. Inside of that, you have the land of Cana and Israel, uh, which is, you know, the promised land, the land for God's people as a but he's given it to them as a possession. And then um, inside of that, you have Jerusalem as the holy city. And inside Jerusalem, you have the, uh, the mountain that the temple sits on. And then you have the, the temple mount, essentially, that we're in. That's a 40-acre, 37 to 40-acre area, massive. Um, as you can see around, there are full-grown trees that are very old, that sort of thing, right? So that's what we might think of as the court of the Gentiles, called the court of the Gentiles. Gentile people like myself could come that far and no further. And then standing uh, behind me would have been the temple, the second temple, um, Solomon's temple, and then it became Zerubbabel's temple and Herod's temple, that second temple period from the time of um, the exile all the way up till AD 70 when it was destroyed. Um, the temple proper is there. And so you'd go through the gate called Beautiful, which is where in Acts chapter 3 the, the guy is healed by Peter and John. And uh, that's called the Court of Women. You go up 15 steps through the Nicanor Gate uh, into the Court of the Israelites. And that's, uh, again, concentric circles of holiness. It's getting more and more restrictive and more and more holy. And then inside of that Court of Israelites, you would have the Holy of Holies where the priest only goes once a year. Uh, Joel Green calls this system a segregating force because not only is it concentric circles of holiness, but it's restricting people more and more. Um, Jesus came to uh, be present with all of us. The Holy Spirit, the temple of the curtain was torn so that his presence could be with all of us. It's not restrictive anymore. The message of the book of Acts is that we all get to dwell with God. It's not in a temple made by human hands. But... It's a cool experience to be up on the Temple Mount here today, and um, we're, uh, we're feeling the, the special privilege that we have to be uh, in this area. Peace. Well, friends, we are at the house of Caiaphas. Uh, in the Gospels, we read about Caiaphas being the high priest. Um, he's also the leader of the council of the Sanhedrin, uh, which likely met upstairs in his mansion at some uh, at some part, the early part of the after the arrest of Jesus. Jesus would have been taken there, and accusations were brought up against him. And um, Caiaphas is extremely wealthy. And he has a lot of power, religious power within the Jewish system, and he's also exceptionally corrupt. And so we read in the Gospels about uh, Jesus going before the, the Sanhedrin and, and false charges being brought against him. And uh, he's likely held uh, that night uh, in a dungeon. This is an old cistern that we're standing in right now, but by the time of Caiaphas in the, the first century, uh, this was used as a dungeon. And so there's a good chance that Jesus spent the night in this cold, dark dungeon that we're standing in right now. And uh, there's some modern amenities, there's stairs and that sort of thing. But right up here, uh, we're going to show you there's a hole in the ceiling. And uh, as we pan up to the hole in the ceiling, uh, this is where they would have likely let Jesus down by ropes into this dungeon uh, down here. He would have... There's a very good chance he would have spent the night here uh, before 
being sent out by Pilate and before officially being condemned to crucifixion. And so, right over here, there's a little pulpit stand and a, a book with Psalm 88, the darkest psalm in the, the Psalter, uh, in 51 different languages for people to come down here and read. And Psalm 88 is famous for ending with the line, and darkness is my only friend. There's a good chance Jesus felt that element here. He had been denied, he had been betrayed by Judas, he had been denied by Peter, and the rest of the disciples went and abandoned him and were hiding, scared in their homes or wherever they were hiding. Um, Jesus was here alone, likely in this dungeon, uh, the night before he died. So it's a, it's a somber, holy place down here, and we remember what Jesus did for us. Peace. Well, guys, even as I watched that last video of Caiaphas's house and being in the, the cistern that's turned into a, a jail cell where likely Jesus spent some time, it, it gives me a lump in my throat to think about um, just how, how serious uh, it was the last night of Jesus's life and the abandonment that he felt. And one thing I didn't mention in the video is up top there's a courtyard, which would have been the courtyard where Peter is uh, and they always have roosters in, in there, uh, so there's roosters crying in the background to just remind you of the denial of Peter denying Jesus. And if you remember in the scriptures that as the rooster crows, that's kind of, uh, you know, Jesus had predicted you'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. And so then the rooster crows and like that all comes back to Peter. He's reminded of Jesus's prediction and I uh, just... You know, thinking about being alone in darkness in that in that cistern, and you know Jesus experiencing abandonment from his disciples, um, it just man. It, it, when I was down there and you know reading Psalm eighty eight together was just really uh, powerful. Psalm eighty eight starts out, um, "Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you." Uh, and maybe that's maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe you. Uh, you acknowledge God as your true Savior in these dark times, these hard times. Maybe you're calling out to God uh, as the God who, who saves you. Uh, I think that's a very appropriate thing. The psalm ends, it's the darkest psalm in the entire Psalter. It ends by saying, you have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. And maybe that's where you're at today. Um, the psalm starts asking for God to save him, and he's struggling throughout the entire psalm, Psalm 88. But it ends on this really dark note of saying, darkness is my closest friend. You've taken friend and neighbor from me. And maybe you're isolated. Maybe you're quarantined. Maybe you can't go out of the house. Uh, maybe you're supposed to have some meetings, have some friends, ha have work, stuff like that. Um, and you've been kept from that because of the virus going around, the pandemic that's going on right now. And uh, we just want to see you and... Uh, and connect with you in this time. It is really hard. It's hard to be alone. It's hard to be disconnected. Um, we're doing everything we can as a church to provide options where people don't have to be disconnected. Uh, how many of you know that in times of crisis is when the church is called to be the church? We're not just the church when things are going rosy and well and good and positive and celebration. Yes, celebration and feast, that's absolutely part of what the church is supposed to do. We want to take that seriously. We want to do that. But another big part of being the church is being the church showing up for each other when things are, when times are bad, when things aren't going well. Uh, and, you know, I mean, just think about, you know, the arrest and betrayal and trial of Jesus. I mean, is there a, a harder time in the, the early church, the book of Acts? It's all, it's pretty much all hardship. I mean, yeah, there's some good moments, miracles and thousands added to the number daily. There's some, some high points, but there's definitely some low points as well. The apostles getting arrested and uh, flogged and all that kind of stuff, martyred. Stephen gets martyred in Acts chapter seven. So there's good times and there's bad times. All those times the church is called to be the church. So we have all sorts of ways for you to connect. Not only do we have sermons, and worship videos on our website, um, but we have a help form. Uh, if you're in need during this time of the COVID crisis, if you're quarantined, if you're lacking resources, if you're lacking food, stuff like that, you can fill out the form that we're going to link to in this video uh, and let us know what you need, you need and we're going to uh, see what we can do uh, to meet some of those needs, to connect uh, people with need to people with uh, uh, who 
have the means. We're gonna we're gonna see how we can resource people and connect people up. Okay, um, if you're looking to connect with a life group, um, there's this book that we're going through as a church together. It's called Core Fifty Two, uh, and it helps you engage with Scripture, just like we. Uh, I, I took you on a tour of the Holy Land and some different places. Uh, this Core 52 book takes you on a little bit of a tour through the scriptures, uh, where we read different scriptures, the most, uh, some of the most important engaging scriptures in all of the Bible, and it helps bring those together. And there's several groups that are meeting to go through this book together. Uh, I know at least one or two of them are meeting online, just logging in from wherever they're at and sharing, encouraging one another. We encourage you to do that. Uh, don't isolate just because, uh, don't isolate in general, because, you know, you have to reach out and connect with somebody, um, do it digitally, uh, virtually, however you need to. Um, again, this is the time for the church to be the church. Let's pray for each other. Let's encourage one another. Let's lift each other up. Uh, let's make sure we're doing what we can to be the community of God in a time like this, uh, because it's just so important. So be aware of that. Uh, life groups are there for you, uh, all sorts of resources on the website. And um, I'm going to pray for us here as we close this Sunday morning. Hopefully the the teaching on site w was helpful for you, uh, helped you visualize some of the things going on in the Gospels. And uh, let me close this in prayer. So Jesus, we just thank you that you're God who interacts with history. Uh, you show up, you showed up, um, you walked this earth, you healed people, real people in real times and places, Lord. And even though we're removed um, by some years, a couple thousand years from that, Lord, we can go back to those sites and visit, uh, visit them uh, and, and see the things you, the places you went. And um, it helps build faith in us. So help us to live that out. Help us to take steps forward in our faith, Lord, even as we're quarantined and apart from one another. And Lord, some of us may be struggling with that. Um, would you be our comfort and our rest in this time? God, I pray that this would be a restorative time. I know that this is an important step we need to take as a nation to get healthy again and to stop the spread of COVID-19. Help us to um, use this opportunity to reconnect with you, um, to get things right in our own lives. Lord, actually use this to make us stronger in our faith, to take steps forward, to start a routine of scripture and prayer and community, even if that has to be virtual and digital for right now. God, you are a good God. We thank you so much for being present in our virtual digital time today. In Jesus' name, amen. Peace, friends.